So up next, we have as our keynote speakers, the Transgender Cultural District. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do some introductions. So founded by three black transgender women in 2017, the Transgender District in San Francisco is the first legally recognized transgender district in the world. Here to talk a little bit about this groundbreaking history and discuss the transgender economic empowerment policy justice inside the district's co-founders, Honey Mahogany, Aria Saeed, and Janetta Johnson. So first up, I want to introduce to the stage Honey Mahogany. Honey is not only a co-founder of the Transgender Cultural District, but also co-owner of the Stud Bar, San Francisco's oldest LGBTQ establishment and the nation's first co-op uh, owned LGBTQ nightlife venue one of the founding queens of Drag Queen Story Hour, a board member of the People Powered and Community Focused Meeting and Learning Space Mannies, a board member of the Queer Performance Art Nonprofit Ox, an appointed member of the San Francisco Democratic County Central Committee and a legislative aide in the District 6 office of Supervisor, uh, San Francisco Supervisor, uh, Matt Haney. Uh, welcome to the stage, honey. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I, I, um, I will correct for the record that I am um, no longer an appointed member of the DCCC, but have gotten elected and now I'm chair of the San Francisco Democratic Party. So I apologize if we got, we sent you an old bio. Uh, <laughs> my, my fault, my fault. Um, so, um, but thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Up next, I want to introduce Aria Saeed. Uh, Aria is a transgender advocate and award-winning political strategist based in San Francisco. She Please is, close my door. She is a founder and the president and chief strategist of the Transgender District, the first district of its kind in the world. Ms. Saeed's work has been featured in CNN, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Travel and Leisure, Forbes, and more. Ms. Saeed is the youngest Black trans woman and trans person to receive uh, resolutions from both the California legislator and California Governor Gavin Newsom. In addition, Ms. Saeed is 2021 through 2022's Pioneers in Social ju in Justice Fellow at the Levi Strauss Foundation and also serves as a board member for the Women's Foundation of California in supporting grant making to gender justice organizations in the state of California. Everyone, welcome, Aria. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you for joining us in today's conversation, Aria. Last but not least, we have Janetta Johnson. So Janetta is the executive director at TGI Justice Project. She is formerly incarcerated Black transgender woman and has been an activist and advocate in the transgender community since 1997, when she moved to San Francisco from her hometown of Tampa, Florida. She's been pol politicized through her kinship with Miss Major, her adopted trans mother, and after her release from prison, returned from her work or to her work uh, with nonprofits and social service agencies with a higher compassion for people on the inside of jails and prisons. In 2006, she put her skills as a community organizer, trainer, and activist to work as an interim director of the TGI Justice Project. And in 2014, she became the permanent executive director of TGIJP when Ms. Major retired from the position. Janetta not only co-founded the Transgender Cultural District, but she also co-founded Taja's coalition, Community Accountability for Black Trans Safety in San Francisco. Janetta is committed to building strategies and interventions to reduce the re recidivism uh, rate for the transgender community by providing uh, leadership opportunities, development, and job opportunities to those who are currently being released from custody. She believes that currently and formerly incarcerated trans people without a voice will be people without hope. She will continue to struggle to instill hope and belief in a better future for every transgender person she can reach. Everyone, give it up for Janetta.
Hello, everybody. Um, it feels really good this morning to be here with the other co-founders um, and taking an opportunity to go back down memory lane. And I'm excited about being in this space and participating in this capacity. Thank you. Well, I'll let you folks take it away. Sure. Well, again, thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm Honey Mahogany, one of the co-founders, and um, I think we wanted to start this presentation out by giving you all um, a brief history of San Francisco and why it became the home of the first transgender cultural district in the world. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oop, it says you cannot start screen share. Um, well, okay, now let me try again. Um, you know, Zoom, we've been doing it for the last two years, and yet it is still sometimes a struggle. Um, here we go, sharing my presentation screen, and let's see if I can get it so it looks a little better. Um, oh, no, the other way. So um, hopefully you all can see that. These slides are really just so that you have something to look at while I'm speaking. So um, this is San Francisco and the San Francisco that many folks know. Um, you know, San Francisco for a long time has really been a beacon of hope um, and an opportunity uh, for people who have for whatever reason felt like they were outcast <clears throat> from whatever communities they may have come from um, and from people who um, were looking to find themselves. Um, this, of course, actually dates back to the very founding of the city, um, the gold rush, although I will, you know, I, I, I should say that there, this is the traditional home of the Ohlone Ramaytush people and who are still here to this day and are the original caretakers of this land. But when we were talking about the history of the place known as San Francisco, just giving you some background on how the city itself was founded. So the gold rush brought people here to this area, people um, from, from Europe, from Asia, from all over the world. Um, and they came here to find basically um, a way to make a lot of money very quickly. Um, and as a result of that, um, it became a very popular place. Um, and eventually because of its location on the coast became an important naval base and shipyard. Um, this of course would eventually actually lead to um, it becoming a very gay place because as many know, um, the, the Navy is, has a strong association with gay people. Um, and there was a naval discharge yard that was here in San Francisco where a lot of people who were you know, dishonorably discharged because they were queer would, um, would be let out and they chose to stay here in San Francisco because of its history as a place for free spirits and art artists and um, of being an accepting place. So San Francisco has had a lot of really, um, I guess you could call them progressive movements, um, artistic movements, including the beatniks and the hippies in the 60s. And then of course, um, shortly thereafter, um, it also became the home of the uh, gay liberation movement, um, as well as um, the larger Bay Area being the home of the Black Panthers. Um, but when we talk specifically about queer San Francisco, um, you know, the, the district was really founded around the central event in this place in uh, the heart of the city known as the Compton's Cafeteria, the Compton's Cafeteria, which um, actually is the, uh, the location where we had the Compton's Cafeteria riot, which predates the Stonewall riots by three full years and happened right here in San Francisco. Um, other than the Compton's Cafeteria riot, San Francisco has been a place that um, has launched many different gay movements and organizations. For example, the Imperial Court System, which is known all over the world today, also got its start right here in San Francisco. And it started because Jose Saria, who um, was a drag performer, um, at some point decided to run for office and became the first openly gay person to run for office in the, in, in the country. Um, he ended up losing, but he actually didn't end up losing by very much. Um, he ended up rallying quite a large amount of votes. And part of the reason that that happened was because there was such a strong um, gay community here in San Francisco. And um, I think people were surprised that Jose Saria got as far as he did. And from that day on, um, politicians have always in San Francisco um, sort of curried the favor or looked towards the gay community as an important constituency due to Jose Saria's trailblazing work. Um, the imperial court system um, was founded when Jose Saria didn't win and then decided that 
you know, if he couldn't be a supervisor, then he would be um, the head of the imperial court system and created a whole system that became the first nonprofit LGBT organization in the world. Um, another thing that has a place here in San Francisco is uh, the Coquettes, um, which were, you know, it's a legendary San Francisco based drag troupe um, and really kind of contributed to the idea of theater of the absurd and um, has really influenced, I think, um, drag and artistic drag and people like Lee Bowery and others um, throughout drag history and also helped to influence the founding of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which is an organization, um, again, that is today known all over the world, but started right here in San Francisco's Castro district. Um, the sisters were actually founded as part of, part of a uh, um, a counter protest. Um, just like you sometimes see today, there were people from religious organizations, anti uh, LGBT organizations who were protesting in the Castro. And there were um, people who lived there who thought it would be a great idea to dress up as nuns and protest the protesters. And they had so much fun doing it that they, um, and they actually were successful in chasing those protesters out, that they um, continued to do it on the regular and eventually founded the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And um, a little known fact about the sisters is that this was, of course, happened um, before the, uh, the HIV and AIDS crisis um, really hit. Um, but when, when, when AIDS hit and um, people were really struggling and no one knew exactly what to do or how to have safe sex, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence actually created the very first pamphlet on how to have safe sex anywhere. And so a lot of the harm reduction around um, H HIV and AIDS was really based on the work of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Um, and then I will, um, the last little piece of uh, queer history that uh, I think is known throughout the world is of course, uh, San Francisco is the home of Harvey Milk, who was the first openly gay man to ever be elected uh, in, in the country and um, was fam well, infamously um, murdered while in office by Dan White, along with Mayor Joan Moscone at the time. So um, all of these things really, I think, help to cement San Francisco's reputation as um, not just a queer Mecca, but um, really, uh, a, a, I think the basis for a lot of queer identity and a lot of our history and culture that has originated here. Um, of course, over time, we have seen that San Francisco has changed. San Francisco is actually known as the city of the Phoenix. Um, it is our emblem um, because we continue to rise from the ashes um, and we continue to recreate ourselves. People are flooding here, still flooding here today from all over the world, all over the country. People are coming in to San Francisco to, you know, be a part of today, the, 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 the tech movement, um, to be a part of the, you know, to invest in real estate here. I mean, there's a lot of things that are drawing people to this city. Um, and people, yes, people are still coming here because San Francisco is a progressive beacon because they don't feel accepted wherever they're living. And um, people are coming here as refugees. And it is a, officially a, a sanctuary city, I believe, was one of the very first sanctuary cities in this country. Um, so I mentioned tech. And of course, you know, the first dot com boom in the late 90s um, and early aughts really, I think, established was really the beginning of San Francisco becoming um, less comfortable for queer people and poor people to move into. Um, and then, of course, more recently, um, during the, I guess, recent tech movement, um, dot com part two, um, we have really seen that in affordability, in affordability uh, skyrocket. And um, it hasn't shown very much um, slowing down even during the pandemic. Yes, rents have gone down slightly, but I think they are still the highest in the country. And um, you know, it is still incredibly hard for people to actually get established here. And what we have also seen over the last few decades is a real exodus of the Black community from San Francisco, San Francisco, um, and the middle class community, uh, working class community, um, and also especially queer and trans people who have been pushed out of the city. Um, I personally have seen, you know, one of the reasons that I got involved in anti-displacement work was because um, I used to work in Contra Costa County as a social worker, and I would see so many trans women, trans women of color being displaced from their housing and their community in San Francisco and being placed in subsidized housing in places like Pittsburgh and Antioch, places where they had no access to transit, where they had no um, 
uh, social services really that they could reach and no, no ability to find a job in that area and really were very isolated. And that you know, became a life and death situation, life or death situation for, for many people. And so that's actually what brought me into this work. Um, but you know, going back to uh, the San Francisco, one of the last affordable places in the city is the Tenderloin. And it's a, a place with a lot of very, very rich history and a lot of connection to the queer community. Um, the Tenderloin has historically been known as a vice district and effectively been treated as a containment zone, dating back again to the very foundations of the city. Um, you know, this reputation as a vice district, some historians actually point to the fact that when during the gold rush, um, when the Chinese came to San Francisco, um, you know, at that time there was the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, um, uh, API people were not allowed to um, do, own property, were not allowed to do certain kinds of work, and so they came here for the gold rush and to build the railroads. But they all, but they, but then they, you know, really. Um, like most people um, were trying to make lives for themselves beyond what was happening in, the, in that moment or maybe the original reason why they came there. And so um, they really struggled to do that. But one thing that they did were able to do was create you know, a version of Chinatown or you know, a ghetto. And because they weren't allowed to participate in certain kinds of business, it really forced them to uh, engage in the vice industry. Um, and you know, this is a tale as old as time, whenever people are excluded from um, the market when they're excluded from being able to have jobs, you know, what do they do? Well, of course, they're going to make money and provide for their families the best way that they can. And sometimes the only option is to engage in, you know, uh, the drug trade, sex work, and all of those things. So when that was happening in Chinatown during the gold rush, um, when the city was still being built up, when the city was filled with a lot of men without families who had nothing much to do, um, they were gambling, drinking, um, you know, and that continued to happen during prohibition and, um, you know, and there were not a lot of women. And so uh, Chinatown at that time actually made quite a lot of money. And, you know, uh, what ended up happening was that the um, non-Chinese folks, mostly white folks who were there at the time saw that and decided that they needed to have their own space where they were also capitalizing on the vice market. And so um, created this alternate vice district in the lower Knob Hill area. Um, this, this district became so prolific over time that um, when police began um, really, you know, patrolling the city and um, establishing understandings with um, owners of, you know, in illegal businesses that if they paid the money that they would leave them alone. Um, this neighborhood was so um, lucrative for the police that it became dubbed the tenderloin, which was, you know, the juiciest, richest cut of meat. Um, and so that is why the tenderloin to this day carries that legacy of sort of illicit behavior of, um, you know, we're, we're sex work and um, substance use and, and, and drug sales and, and has, you know, to this day, one of the, you know, craziest open air drug markets um, in the country um, because of that legacy dating back to the very founding of the city and the neighborhood specifically. Um, now, the bright side of the Tenderloin being known as the Spice District is that it also um, was lawless at a time when the law was really built against trans and gender nonconforming people and queer people. At the time, there were these public decency laws, which um, basically prevented people um, from appearing in public if they were considered unseemly or didn't conform to, to what was considered acceptable. And this could be disabled people, disfigured people, but it certainly also included trans people and gender nonconforming people. And so if you were assigned male at birth and wearing female clothing, you could be jailed. Um, you were not allowed to walk around in the streets. Um, and of course you could not find work. Uh, but the exception was in the Tenderloin where you know, the trans community had, uh, you know, the ability to walk out on the streets as, as who they were. Um, and we were able to find work through whether it was the drug trade or, you know, more often than not the sex trade. And uh, it became a place where we were able to find housing that we were able to live. And um, so the Tenderloin really became the first queer and trans neighborhood in San Francisco, a place that was affordable, a place where people could be themselves and where people could find community. Um, 
the um, and so at that so I think I've established basically the reason why um, the tenderloin specifically and that neighborhood is so important to the trans community. So at this time, I will pass it on to our, my co-founder Janetta um, in case um, so that she can talk about the um, 111 Taylor Building and its importance to the trans district. Hi, thank you everybody. Yes, um, I was just uh, sitting here listening to um, Honey Mahogany and thinking about all the history around San Francisco, the Tenderloin, um, what is currently known as the Compton's Transgender Cultural District, um, the Transgender Cultural District, and um, coming here in 1997 and walking through that neighborhood, going to meet um, someone that I only know as Major, and um, and coming to San Francisco and coming directly to the Tenderloin, um, finding a transgender support group there, attending the transgender support group, um, and just the rich history of the time that I've been here and um, working in the Tenderloin for like 20 something years. And, and in a lot of ways, I felt very safe in the Tenderloin and I felt very protected. And part of that, because after six months of moving here, um, I, um, I, um, I started working in the community and got to know a lot of the community members and got to have a lot of great um, conversation with them, working at various nonprofit organizations that are being housed in the Tenderloin are that serve Tenderloin community members, uh, such as Glide Memorial, um, um, Health Rate 360, formerly known as Walden House, and um, Black Brothers of Steam, and just really um, um, working at the City of Refuge, Arca Refuge, and, and just um, developing and creating programs and opportunity to expand the services that, um, expanding the services to support um, the Black trans community, trans people of color, trans people coming directly out of jails and prison. And um, also um, knowing that right on the corner of Turk and Taylor, there's a plaque that introduced and talks a little bit about Compton's um, um, riot. And, um, and I can identify a lot with the way in which um, trans people um, often are like isolated in one area, specifically if you're a sex worker, or drug users, or even in the company of people that fit that description and just, um, um, just really um, being passionate about um, like trying to be consider some type of um, peace and solace and potentially like rehabilitation or restructuring um, and supporting other trans people and thinking about safety and opportunity and housing and struggling and, uh, and lack of access that a lot of people face in a different way in the past. Um, but um, being someone who has worked in this community and work with the constituents that live in the co community for over 26 years. And um, I, um, Com Compton's Cafeteria was a place that trans people, I don't say that they feel completely safe. Um, it's usually a situation where when, <laughs> when businesses go bad, and they're run down and the people that people don't frequent it that way as much and they are at their last end. And that's generally when they allow certain communities to frequent the businesses. And I think it was just one of those situations where uh, in the district, it wasn't considered a safe place for mainstream society. 
So um, Gene Compton didn't ha didn't garner the revenue that he expected, or you know the socioeconomic that they expected, and it's run down. Nobody's visiting, so that's when people allow the trans community to come in and charge us much more rent. And I, I even think about a lot of the hotels that are in that district. If you notice that um, in that neighborhood, a lot of them are run down. And it's just like a lot of times <clears throat> that's when they rent to us. When, cause I hear that I hear the history that a lot of celebrities stayed in those hotels, but there was also a lot of drug use, a lot of things that devalued the property. And I feel like that's the only way that we were allowed to really be a part of the Compton's um, um, I mean the um the um transgender um district in the area where we are, and so um so that's usually how it works is we get uh we get to participate in there, but we also get not only mistreatment from the owner of the cafe, but also the cops and a lot of things that impacted trans people in a very negative impact. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to go after the building, which is 111 Taylor, um, and secure the building so that we can um, house uh, Black trans um, opportunities and house, um, open up that housing structure for um, trans people. I have been lived in that building for a year when I was on federal probation. And if you go in, I mean, I don't like the fact that the probation and jails and all that stuff is involved, but it would be a nice structure. We thought it would be a nice structure to house trans people in there. Trans people struggled in that neighborhood. Trans people had a very difficult time um, trying to find opportunities for um, economic justice. Or, so it's just like my um, whole experience being in that building, like this should, belong, this should be in the hands of trans people. This should be in the hands of black, black and brown, trans people of color, specifically trans people that have struggled and lived in this neighborhood and was not treated fairly and not really giving um, opportunities. But we went after the uh, building and it was made very clear that um, GO care and the city and county um, pro probation and parole um, had um, very tight strings on that building. And they were at the beginning of a five-year lease and we were not able to um, exactly get that building, which was a very sad disappointment for, for us because we've done a lot of running around, a lot of organizing, bringing community together. And, um, and we were not leaving without anything. And a lot of that was just based on like, at some point in time, we have to have some redistribution conversations around um, communities that suffer at the hands of systemic oppression. So that was kind of like really my biggest premise this year. Is like, uh, and a lot of it was based on my experience living in Florida as a sex worker. Um, that eventually got strung out on drugs and walked the streets for many, many years. It was just like, and they kept us in this very dis disproportionate neighborhood where there were very little opportunities. And so coming into the Compton's Transgender Cultural District and really, really identifying with, you know, the dehumanizing and the suffering that a lot of trans people have experienced in that neighborhood and how we took nothing and made something. I think about my own experience as a black trans woman coming out in Florida, living basically living in shacks because we had to remain as invisible as we possibly could. So the majority of our windows were boarded up. Don't get me wrong, when you came out inside the house, it was laid out, but out of fear, we had overgrown bushes and, and boarded up windows where we would have to slide in and out of the house and hope people don't see us and follow us, cause us harm. And it was just like, I just really 
my prayer, my meditation, my conversations with the ancestors. I don't know if anybody could see those photos that are in behind my picture, but one of them is a picture of Bobby Jean Baker, and one of them is a picture of Mel, who are both um, um, transcestors of color who have been a part of TGIJP and been a part of TGIJP work and has helped sustain this organization um, when they were here. But mainly just thinking about um, how do we, how do we, how do we restore, do some restorative justice and restore faith in the trans community and just give them a different perspective of what is it like to have ownership? What does that mean to have black ownership here in the city and county of San Francisco in California? What does it mean to um, create opportunity for other trans people coming here? Like many, many, many of us came here knowing very little information. All we knew was there was a possibility being trans, queer, Black, you know, brown, that there is a possibility that our life could be better from where we come from. And just really, really thinking about creating this lifetime placeholder that kind of says you're not safe, but you're in a safer environment because there is a district here that is being created and designed and laid out to create some elements of safety, some elements of having a more immediate access to the trans community. I know most people come to um, San Francisco and we don't know how things are gonna go. We don't know how we're gonna make it, but I think having this transgender cultural district is like a, like a specific placeholder that if you come new in this city, I would hope that you would be able to look up that address and someone will be able to point you to the right resources, the right opportunities. So that was like a lot of the thought process when we realized that we could not get the district, but, and I don't think any of us was leaving without something that um, represents the, um, the labor that trans people contribute to this world. And um, I don't know, it was just very significantly and, and important. And I think we were all um, very passionate about like that having this opportunity and this safer um, guiding space that people can come to and get some idea on how to um, put themselves in some safer situations because I think a, a lot of us struggled when we got here and some of us had to sleep on the streets, some of us had to sleep in shelters, some of us had to sleep in some very unsafe conditions that compounded the trauma that we were coming here to relieve ourselves of or get away from. But I'm gonna be quiet for now. Thank you all. Um, I appreciate everybody giving me the opportunity to share. I think we're, um, thank you so much, Janetta. I think we're now gonna go to Arya Saeed to talk about the, uh, the current state of the district. Yes, for the current state of the district. Um, I, again, am so happy to be here with y'all. Um, it's not often that um, Janetta and Honey and I get to come back together and sort of uh, reflect on the amazing journey that we've had in the last five short years of the trans district. Um, something that Janetta was highlighting, and I just want to reiterate it, is the catch-22 of um, the Compton's Cafeteria Riot taking place in August 1966 and being led by trans people, um, a revolt, a revolution that happened after um, police were raiding the cafeteria, the restaurant, as they so often did, and arresting trans people and drag queens and non-binary folk. And then, you know, uh, 55 years later, the building, the site, um, of that incident, of that moment in um, the first documented uprising of queer and trans people in the United States 
Um, that building is actually owned by the Geo Group, which is a private for-profit prison company, um, which is what Ms. Janetta was highlighting. And so it's used as um, halfway housing and, and probation center there. And um, we, our advocacy really started with fighting for that space to be back in the hands of the community. And um, we have still consistently tried to acquire that space um, and yeah, they just keep playing with us. So um, we are, yeah. So the building currently now is um, the owner last year just told us that if we wanted to buy the building, it would cost $25 million. Um, isn't that crazy? Just do, yeah. It's just crazy. So our advocacy continues in that um, we, uh, transgender is in fact a place on earth. Um, LOL, y'all can laugh. I know I can't hear any laughter, but I know it's there. But um, we are in the Southeastern Tenderloin neighborhood. Um, and so we have the Taylor Street corridor going into the Sixth Street corridor, if you know San Francisco. Um, and we're six city blocks. Um, and yeah, um, let's see. Oh, we can do the next slide. So um, just for, uh, just so that y'all know, we did change our name um, during the pandemic from Compton's Cafeteria, excuse me, Compton's Transgender Cultural District to simply the Transgender District. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to move away. We wanted to preserve that history and that, that culture of that moment, but also acknowledging that um, the cafeteria itself was named after a white cis man, Gene Compton, who owned a string of diners across the Bay Area. And we just kind of really thought and felt that we were sort of upholding his legacy just as much as our work. And we wanted to be a bit more explicit about what our work was uh, to designed for and who it was designed to benefit. And And that's um, you know, I think when we sort of announced the trans district in 2017, it became um, news around the world. And often um, people would abbreviate it to just the transgender district. And so that's what stuck with us. And I think, um, so we kind of have both names and I think we have this really cool experience um, of, of, of an organization sort of going through a trans experience and changing our name and sort of reclaiming our legacy and what that means um, for us for the next hundred years. Um, and so the mission of the Trans District, um, this is a mission statement that myself, Janetta and Honey, as well as Stephanie Ashley and Nate Albee uh, created when we were running the coalition for the Trans District. Um, and so the mission of the Trans District is to create an urban environment that fosters the rich history, culture, legacy, and empowerment of trans people. Um, and so we're aiming truly to stabilize and economically empower our community um, and to educate the broader world about the amazing contributions that trans people have made to history and to celebrate the rich history of our neighborhood and the presence. Um, we have the densest population, a transgender population of any other neighborhood in San Francisco um, and perhaps any other neighborhood in the country with many of our residents being trans folks of color um, and the unfortunate reality that we're actively working to change is that nearly over 70% of trans people that do live in our neighborhood are um, living in abject poverty and or in homelessness. And when I say abject poverty, I mean living on less than 10,000 a year, being marginally housed, um, so maybe different scenarios from being housed in the SROs and from time to time having to be on the streets, um, folks coming out of jails and prison, um, as well as folks who may be literally homeless. Um, and so literally homeless as in like tent encampments and what have you. Um, and so that's a reality that we're working to change. Um, next slide, please. Oh, um, actually, I want to highlight that photo on the mission page, if we could go back. Um, and so this was um, an effort that we did in 2020 during the pandemic um, to celebrate the 54th anniversary of the Compton's Cafeteria Riots. And so that intersection is Turk and Taylor, the famous intersection that we've all been referencing. 
Um, and so some incredible advocates um, and artists and allies and what have you gathered together um, and created a Black Trans Lives Matter mural um, in the intersection. Um, and that effort was led by Honey Mahogany and um, Counterpulse. Um, and it took all day to make. And, and so those are some of the uh, community members and advocates um, that led that process as well. Um, and so, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so this is our team. Um, and so we have grown considerably in the last couple of years. Um, three years ago, it was just me. And then, um, well, first it was just Honey, and then it was just me. And then uh, we uh, hired Sean and then uh, Janelle, and then um, the team has expanded and uh, we're now running sort of seven to 10 different programs, which I'm happy to share more about. Um, but this is a snapshot of our team, next slide. Great. And so there's that lovely mural that y'all can see. And so as a legally recognized cultural district, um, and Honey remembers this, uh, we all worked on a cultural district legislation through Supervisor Hillary Ronan in San Francisco to protect the work of cultural districts. Um, there are currently eight legally recognized cultural districts in San Francisco, including the transgender district. And so, you know, many people ask me often, often what is a cultural district? Um, and some loose examples that we've seen in every, probably every major American city has been um, Chinatown or Little Italy or what have you. And those are loose examples of a cultural district in which uh, their hallmarks include having sort of a localized economy that circulates within each other. Um, so businesses owned by that community, um, families that own those businesses, and then um, they support those businesses um, sort of intra-personally, if you will, they support within their community. Um, so my grandpa would always say, you know, the American dollar circulates four times in Chinatown before it leaves. And that's actually um, something that's quite true of many cultural districts is that uh, the resources economically circulate throughout those businesses before it exits the community. And then the broader public gets to come in and sort of engage in the culture and the presence and the food and all those things that make a cultural district sort of desirable. And so um, we have six mandates as a legally recognized cultural district, but we added a seventh, um, which will make sense in a moment. But um, our areas of work focus on tenant protections, economic and workforce development, um, arts and culture, cultural heritage conservation, land use, cultural competency, and of course, transgender empowerment. Um, and the reason why we added that is because the reality of our work in leading um, such a beautiful project and an idea that trans people can sort of have our own neighborhood um, and that if the world won't hire us for jobs, if the world won't house us, then it's up to us to create a thriving, neighborhood where trans people are economically and socially empowered. The reality is, is that we, unlike other cultural districts, have to build that from scratch. And so, you know, when you go to often like LGBT neighborhoods or gayborhoods in other cities, um, you know, those communities over the last 50 years have been able to come into business ownership and they have bookstores and restaurants and bars and uh, retail stores and gyms and what have you. And then the community actually is able to be a sort of part of the land owning class and own homes and what have you. And so those attributes of those communities allow them to be self-sustaining in those neighborhoods, even in the midst of possible sort of displacement. The trans district and trans community, as many of you all are quite aware, we don't have those sort of foundations of economic empowerment, um, obviously because of our marginalization um, and, and, and what have you. But I think also too, we've just never have been given those opportunities. And I don't think we can expect the um, same opportunities to be able to apply to us, that we have to reinvent and reconfigure how we create opportunities for trans people. Um, and so we have 
an amazing uh, journey ahead of us and that we're working to um, build from scratch a framework and a foundation so that a hundred years from now, the neighborhood will look entirely different and that the economic profile and the social profile of trans people will look very different than I think me or the other founders could ever imagine. Next slide, please. Great, and next slide. Great, so next slide. Sorry, I should have re-reviewed this. There we go, there's our map. Um, and so the slides were also talking about um, the placemaking efforts that we do. And so if you have been to the Trans District, um, over the last three years, we've worked very diligently to have every light pole painted in the trans flag colors. Um, and this past year, we launched having banners with the name of the Trans District on every single light pole as well. Uh, we also work in partnership with the city on many different areas of our work, including urban planning and urban beautification. Um, and so we are currently in 2022, we'll be installing uh, trans flag crosswalks at the Turk and Taylor intersection, as well as on 6th and Mission. Um, and then we also are installing, um, what are those called? Sorry, cement block benches um, in that corridor. Something that oftentimes happens in the inner city is there's nowhere to sit. Um, whereas when you go to other neighborhoods in San Francisco, there are benches and what have you, um, parklets that people can come and sort of rest and sit. And so we've been working very hard on that. And uh, we will have trans people throughout history um, engraved in those cement blocks um, as part of us sharing um, pieces of history. And so we have trans people that we found in the 1800s and the 1600s. Um, and then of course, you know, throughout the 1900s as well. And so very excited to do that. Um, and then we are also planting trees. So by summer of 2022, there will be more trees throughout the neighborhood. Um, it's very, as someone with a very similar experience to Ms. Janetta of being in the Tenderloin and, and coming um, to, the, to the Tenderloin neighborhood, there are hallmarks of other communities that I wish we had more of. And so, um, and so, sorry, I just got an email. Um, thank you. But um, yes, so trees are like a sign of wealth in other neighborhoods that we just don't have the luxury of having in the inner city. And they provide shade and protection from the wind. If anyone's walked around the uh, Tenderloin neighborhood, they know that it's a wind tunnel. Um, and it's very easy to get wind swept and it's partly because there are no trees in that neighborhood. And so that's something we've been working on as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so we've done public awareness campaigning. This is our um, campaign from the, um, that we did for Transgender Day of Visibility um, this past year in 2021. And so this campaign is still up. You can see it on billboards across the Bay uh, bridge. You can see it on Muni and BART stations um, all across the city of San Francisco. It's expanded to street banners as well as um, bus stops. And I don't want to hold y'all and be too long-winded. So um, I'm just going to have us rest here. Perfect. And then um, just sort of chat with you all on some of the partnerships and projects and things that we've been up to. And so you know, what does a trans district do? Um, we have had to kind of figure that out for ourselves. And I'm very excited that we have some exciting economic empowerment efforts that I just wanted to share with you all. And so um, we worked with the city of San Francisco um, in creating guaranteed income for trans people. It was work that we had piloted uh, with our COVID-19 mutual aid fund in March of 2020. And so if people remember back then, um, Mayor Breed had sheltered in place or called for the city of San Francisco to shelter in place. And then days later, me and my team were like, we were navigating the realities of a pandemic, just like everyone else. We were in line at, that gro at the grocery stores for hours and hours, trying to stock up on food, fighting with 
other customers for the last batch of potatoes or Oreos, if y'all recall. And then, you know, we were pulling out credit cards, you know, our credit cards to, to pay for food. And we were thinking about how many of our folks in our neighborhood don't have that safety net. And so we created the COVID-19 mutual aid fund that we started, uh, which is simply giving folks $150 to $200 in cash um, over Venmo, PayPal, et cetera. And um, to date, we've provided over 600 trans people across the country with those grants, but we've also helped other nonprofits replicate our mutual aid model. At that time, no one else was doing that work. Um, of mutual aid and not at the scale that of which we were doing it at. Um, and so we worked with over 35 uh, trans-led and LGBT nonprofits across the country to replicate that for their own communities. Um, and so that's, you know, a huge reason why you even sort of see mutual aid sort of existing today is because no one knew if we could do that through 501c3 nonprofits, right? Um, but we also documented that process um, and you know, studied guaranteed income uh, models. Actually, it was a conversation that me, Janetta and Honey had had in New Orleans a few years ago where we were talking about piloting universal basic income. And we had heard about Mayor Michael Tubbs, um, who was the mayor in the city of Stockton, uh, creating that in a United States city, which had never happened before. And so now the city of San Francisco has just announced that they will be committing to uh, supporting and facilitating guaranteed income for trans people with 110 trans people receiving $1,000 a month for 18 months. Um, and they're doing that through the city's treasury. Um, we are also partnering. And so we're partnering with them on that as well as partnering with um, uh, uh, excuse me, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts to support um, trans artists also with guaranteed income. Um, we recently just did a partnership with DoorDash in providing um, over 100 vouchers for Black trans people facing food insecurity um, across the United States. And so that's some of the um, national advocacy work that we've been doing. Um, but locally, um, some programs that I'd like to highlight is our entrepreneurship accelerator program. We graduated our first cohort of black and brown trans folks in January of 2021. Um, and we had this crazy idea of doing, this was during 2020 in which it was being developed. And I was working with many different tech companies to sort of make sure that they give back to our community during this sort of political moment in which people got Repoliticized with the Black Lives Matter movement and also acknowledging Black Trans Lives Matter. And um, we partnered with the Long Term Stock Exchange in providing a boot camp space for trans people who were aspiring entrepreneurs but had multiple barriers to entrepreneurship. And we wanted to center Black and Brown trans people with ideas that would make sense from ideation to launch. And so um, we took them through a program. And then upon graduation, they received full sponsorship of their tax filing forms. We sponsored their websites, their brand logos, um, what have you. And then we also provided them with seed grants um, to start their businesses. And so um, excitingly, we've been able to support um, Miss Bianca Simone with the launch of her shapewear company, um, Snatched by Simone, um, which you all can find online. Um, and she's doing really beautiful work and making sure that things, her products are size inclusive for plus sizes as well as for um, straight size folks, as well as um, for different skin tones. As a darker skinned Black trans woman, uh, but also just as a darker skinned person, it is hard to find my nude at any store. And so that's something she's really been prioritizing. She's already sold out of her first set of inventory which is really exciting. Um, another participant of ours, uh, Jojo, had started a collective um, uh, called Fluid and um, now has a co-op and they actually just launched their coffee shop at La Cocina Marketplace, um, which is sort of like a bazaar, if you will, like a bazaar where there's different vendors and um, small businesses housed inside of this space. 
And so they just launched their trans owned co-op coffee shop program and they're hoping to expand to have storefront and event space. Um, and so that's something you can check out every day of the week, um, their project. And then um, we're supporting um, two trans people in Missouri who are opening a vegan bakery. And then um, a black non-binary chef in Oakland um, who actually just did their po first pop-up in Oakland called Comfort. And they're hoping to, uh, we've been working very hard to bring it to the trans district in some way, but we've been actively working with them with their business plans and providing seed funding for those efforts because it is our belief that if we provide a pathways to entrepreneurship for trans people, especially black and brown trans people, that we also, you know, we provide grants, we don't provide loans, we don't sort of, we, we don't believe in that. What we believe in is that you then make a commitment that when you're, um, when you take your business from ideation to launch, that they, you're then able to make a commitment financially of hiring back from within the community and bringing people you know, into your business as employees or staff or co-ops or whatever you decide. And then that is what starts to create a more thriving economic system for and by trans people. Um, another effort that we've launched is our housing program. Um, it's called Hot Housing. It's a housing concierge program. Um, and this is very important. We don't do supportive housing. Um, we never as a project want to duplicate what already exists. Uh, we only want to sort of fit, fill the gaps that we see missing. And so much of the housing resources in San Francisco, but around California are focused on, you know, urgent crisis response housing, which so many projects do. Um, TJJP does that, Our Trans Home does that. There's so many organizations that do that critical work of urgent crisis response housing. But what we were finding is that trans people who were sort of exiting from that space um, of urgent homelessness crisis response housing and sort of starting to get jobs and what have you, were not able to access the housing market in San Francisco in any way. And so what we did was we partnered with uh, developers and we forced them, wink, wink, to, um, we forced them to reduce their market rate rent values. And then we provide a subsidy on top of that. And so um, the target is trans folks who are working in service-based economies like um, barista or Lyft driver or doing sex work like OnlyFans or what have you. And then um, folks who are maybe working part-time or, you know, hours change week to week, especially if you work in retail. And so that's who we targeted. Um, we have 100% occupancy in that program. And we've been able to provide them with, um, they, they have the lease with the building. We don't have the lease. We just help them get to that space, um, which is really exciting. And I think the great thing is that these were brand new buildings, um, which H HVAC systems, brand new carpet, like, state-of-the-art furniture like it the the rubric for what units we picked was really me going in and being like would I live here and if I wouldn't live there then we didn't partner with them and that's how it kind of worked and so I think um what's been really great about that program is you know everyone's really satisfied I know that um people have very polarizing opinions around new developers and developments I just needed as a leader to make sure that our community had safe housing that was maintained. And that's why we opted to work with sort of these developers that had these newer buildings because we wanted to make sure that like, you know, there wasn't mold, that there was good ventilation, that the doors were operating. Um, because I've lived in SROs where the windows are broken and they don't fix them. I've lived in these spaces where they're not maintained and they're not empowering in any way. And then lastly, I just wanted to highlight um, that we have an active partnership for job training and career development for trans people, um, but it's not in the way that you might think. Um, so, you know, we're a very small team. And so we don't have this like traditional sense of like job training where we, like many of the job training programs, just they feel like very bureaucratic. You come in, you do your intake, and then they make you go through all these different workshops and you're just kind of sitting there and and then you go to a job fair and then you don't really hear anything back from any of those jobs. And so we didn't want that. So what we did was 
we partnered with different companies specifically that we know can hire trans people on the spot. Um, and so I'm excited to share that we just did a film festival with Clock Map. They have a filmmaker uh, training program um, and fellowship program for trans people who are interested in doing film and digital media. Um, and so if folks are interested in that, they can access that. Um, we're doing a partnership with Glamorama Salons, um, which is a chain of salons throughout San Francisco and Berkeley um, and providing um, internships for trans people interested in cosmetology. Um, so folks who want to be in the hair and beauty space. Um, and so they can get internship roles as like front desk, um, shampoo girl, like those traditional jobs. And then we're working on building out an apprenticeship model so that um, trans people who may um, shy away from committing fully to a cosmetology program um, could do a hybrid of training on the job at the salons, as well as doing um, the, the schooling for, for being credentialed as a licensed cosmetologist. Um, and so, yeah, let me stop there because of course I could tell you all the other millions of programs that we're working on, um, but just affirming that um, my last thought, which is I think for our work to be most impactful, um, trans people have to be the creators of the solutions that impact trans people specifically. Um, and I think that's something that's been really great about our work at the Trans District is that um, trans people are the thought leaders behind that work. And I think it's why we see the impact um, in such a strong way, as opposed to oftentimes like, we need our allies and we need our, our supportive, broader LGBT community to support our work. But I think we need to see more trans people in decision-making roles um, in leading their own organizations, their own companies, their own projects, um, but also uh, leading and creating their own job training programs or their own small business development programs so that more and more people, yeah, that we create and expand economic empowerment for our community. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you all for being able to um, share a lot about the Transcultural District. Um, we do have questions for the audience. I'm gonna invite back Honey, uh, Adia, and Janetta to uh, come back to the virtual stage. Um, and thank you folks for like, there, there's just so many brilliant programs. Like I need to watch, I have to rewatch this <laughs> because like I, I'm doing the, the, um, the PowerPoint on the back end. So I was just like, oh, I need to take notes. Like this is just brilliant nuggets of information. But yeah, trans folks leading the work, just so important. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we do have questions from the audience. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask some of the questions. So uh, one of the first uh, questions that came up early on, um, and um, this is from Stephanie. <laughs> I don't know if this is, if we're offering, but Stephanie is asking, are you trying to raise the 25 million to purchase the building? How might we help? I'm not sure if that's from Stephanie's wallet. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think that there. So I think that there is uh, the issue of who owns the building, which the building is owned by Geo Group, which is um, the largest uh, prison industrial complex company in the world, um, and so they have unlimited resources. I do not think that they are willing at this time to sell that building. Period. Um, so you know, I think that we've explored how can we you know, get them out of the building, but, you know, what, from what we have found so far, they, they are unwilling to sell, but, you know, if we can raise $25 million and try and convince them otherwise, let's do it. Well, it's also a great debate too. Like, I think, do we give 25 million to a for-profit prison company or do we, if we acquire that level of resource, do we just invest it back into our community? Like, I feel like the long-standing impact of 25 million would really be in the hands of our community as opposed to buying that building and then spending years trying to renovate it and bring it up to code and then trying to house people, right? Like, I think that's what makes it such a tricky balance. 
is, you know, our communities don't gain access to resources at that level. Um, very rarely do we do any, I mean, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a trans led organization that has that level of financial resource. Um, and if we did, is, is it wise to invest the money in that direction? Um, because when we started our 111 Taylor advocacy, the price for the building was 5 million. And that was a very different reality um, that we were thinking of, right? And w our goal wasn't for us to buy it directly, but it was for the developer of which we were fighting to pay them and give the building to the community in a trust. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we also have another question from Lisa. Any advice to someone who would like to repeat this, say in San Jose or Santa Clara County? Any advice for repeating? This program in San Jose or Santa Clara? Oh, County? like replicating a trans district or an LGBT right. district? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, well, honey, you're like the queen of cultural district legislation. <laughs> um, well, I would say that, you know, I think it's important to look at the history of space and, and how that how that plays into it, right? And who's there. And, 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 and I think a key part of cultural districts too is that, you know, um, and I think Arya alluded to this as well, like there is the history of the Tenderloin, which is very LGBT and trans-centered. And then there's the reality, which is that the Tenderloin is still the place with the densest population of trans folks probably anywhere in the world. Um, or definitely anywhere in the US. And so, um, you know, where we have that continuation of, of, of history and legacy and making sure that it is not eroded, I think is the impetus of it. So it's not just like, you know, we're gonna create a trans district here because we think it's important and there are trans community members around, but like that this is actually a hub of transgender activity and history and resilience and that there's a reason for that district to be created there. Um, so whether it's LGBT, um, you know, there's, we also have the Castro Cultural District in San Francisco and the Soma LGBTQ Leather Cultural District, right? And again, like it's tied to the existence of businesses and communities in those spaces. So I know that in places like San Jose and other places, there are these like LGBT sort of areas, right? Where we have a concentration of bars and um, other businesses that cater to the LGBT community. And so if you're going to create that, you know, looking at what number... There is a little bit of a playbook, like what you know, cultural institutions are there historically, what still exist, who's there now, and then also like what are the goals that you're trying to do or, or create. Um, uh, I think some some advice outside of that, which I have always given to other cultural districts, and um, they haven't always listened to me, but that's okay. You know, we all go through our own journeys. Is that it is helpful to um, to be small in the beginning. And by small, I don't mean just like one or two people, although that is really helpful, I think, in you know, again, like keeping the agency agile, especially when there isn't a lot of funding, like not being too big at the beginning is really helpful. But even in terms of like the coalition of folks you bring together, you want to have broad support, but you also want to be able to make decisions quickly and, and to sort of uh, get work done quickly in the beginning. And so keeping that sort of, you know, maybe having five or six organizations that, you know, band together and helps do this or five or six people on a board that are really doing a majority of the work. I found that to be the most effective model in establishing these cultural districts and that when you get to these boards of like 30 people and like 50 organizations, um, it becomes unwieldy, un like it's just, it's too hard to navigate and people get stuck. Um, in the process. And, you know, our community likes to process a lot. And so, you know, processing about processing and, um, and then they, you know, and then on the other hand, you have, you know, the incredible work that Aria has been able to do through, through um, Fiat <laughs> of, you know, really creating a, a, an amazing district um, under her leadership, um, I think has, has to do with the fact that she was able to be agile and flexible and, and really respond in the moment. Yeah, thank you, folks. Uh, our next question is from Lynn, and this is for Aria. So Aria, how did you get developers to reduce the rents? Um, yes, okay. Well, you can't just like knock on any developer's door. 
<laughs> and get them to inc uh, increase or decrease the rent. Uh, what we did specifically is we had come into some resources during 2020. So if you remember um, during 2020, actually the trans district went viral along with the Marsha P. Johnson Institute and like other projects that are black trans at the Okra project, et cetera. And so um, Christina Aguilera shouted us out. We took over Selena Gomez's Instagram page. Um, Elizabeth Warren, we did something on her page. All these different sort of celebrities got involved in our work um, and signal boosted, right? And then a lot of people donated. And so we um, had come into a level of resource that we wanted to launch the housing concierge program in a way that felt um, lovely and affirming and what have you. And so we actually partnered with a developer that we had worked with before um, called Star City. And um, Honey, actually, when she was the district president at that time um, in 2018, she had led the negotiation process with a developer to give us um, or to encumber a lifetime lease agreement commercial storefront space. Um, which we have for the next 120 years or something like that, something crazy. So uh, we worked with that developer during the pandemic. This was our sort of blessing in disguise. The pandemic happened, right? It was a horrible experience, but it also was very illuminating. What happened was that so many people left San Francisco. There was like a great exodus. Apparently Wall Street Journal says that San Francisco was the only city to have that level of an exodus of people leaving San Francisco during the pandemic. And so there was all these vacant units and that's when we like scooped in and we were like, hi, don't you need to, you know, rent those out? Aren't you losing money? Um, and then, you know, we provided a subsidy on top but because we took eight to 10 units up front we were able to negotiate a lower rate for each unit as opposed to the market rate. And so that's how we have it, did it. So far, other developers have asked to work with us as well. Um, some of them being more flexible, some of them being less flexible, but I think um, for any organization that may be interested in doing a housing program of some sort um, and wanting to focus on permanent housing where the uh, folks that you're working with are the actual tenants, not, we didn't want to be the landlord. We didn't want to evict people. We didn't want any of that, right? Uh, all we did was we had a holding agreement for those units. Um, and so anyone that might consider that, thinking about in, in gaining sort of for the next 12 months, um, units in bulk and then reducing the price of each one. So we were able to take each unit from $1,750 a month to $1,200 a month. And then we provided the subsidy on top. So we provide $700 a month per participant. Um, and so our participants pay $700 a month or sorry, $500 to $700 a month for their unit. And we picked a profile of units across um, San Francisco. So we have folks living, uh, trans folks in Alamo Square. We have trans folks in downtown Oakland. We have trans folks in Russian Hill, um, Selma, et cetera. And so we wanted also people to have choice. Oftentimes as a trans person in the Tenderloin, the only place we traditionally have been able to live is the Tenderloin. And so we wanted trans people to be able to decide what neighborhood they actually wanted to live in. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Our, our next question comes from Kenya, and Kenya is asking, so many nonprofits and resource centers that are Black trans-led end after the founders leave or become conflated with under uh, individual career missions. How do you as founders balance working together and ensure the survival of the trans district beyond the founding team? Um, I guess I can answer that. Sorry, I don't mean to, I, I don't want to <laughs> dominate the conversation, but I think, um, well, okay, so as founders, I think what's important to know is that we all were established in our work at the time of the founding of the trans district. Uh, we all had accolades and affirmations for our work. We were already critically acclaimed each in our own right for the work that we had been doing. Janetta had been leading TGI Justice Project. Uh, for quite some time. Um, Honey had been doing advocacy work as well as co-owning 
um, the nation's first LGBT co-op bar, um, but had also been, you know, working as a social worker and had been, you know, on RuPaul's Drag Race and what have you. And then, you know, I had been doing policy and sex worker advocacy for many, many years before the trans district. And I think the thread that has carried our work is, um, is, is that we've all been also actively working in other spaces and that has only helped and supported the first few years of the trans district. But I will say now, I think what's been really great is uh, we do have a team of emerging trans leaders who um, have been a part of the trans district um, over the last couple of years. And you know, e and when they leave the trans district, they're sort of able to go on and do projects and things that they dreamed about. And I think that's what makes it really special is we get to sort of, you know, whether people like that or not, we get to sort of be like a boot camp program for like social justice advocacy and social change work. And then those leaders get developed and then they go on and they make these huge milestone achievements in their own right, in their own neighborhoods, in their own communities. And like, that's what it's all about. Um, when I came back to lead the district, I wanted to support emerging leaders because someone did that for me. So Stephanie Ashley of St. James Infirmary helped me pivot from um, the work that I had been doing into like leadership roles. And um, our team now, like Jupiter Peraza just created the Transgender History Month um, proclamation in San Francisco with Mayor Breed. Um, I don't know if folks know, um, in August in San Francisco, every year going forward is now legally a transgender history month in San Francisco. And that was something that she was very passionate about. And because of, you know, the brand utility and the legacy of our work, you know, was able to have access to Mayor Breed in that way to create this proclamation. And then um, each of our team members they, I always tell them they're leading this thing. I'm just here to make sure everyone gets paid, uh, that the lights don't get cut off and that like the bills are all paid and you know, what have you. But um, each of our team members is also, it, so the trans district is an org, but also a professional development project. And so each of the trans people on staff are required to also do a fellowship. And so we have Ivory, who's doing a fellowship with Black AIDS Institute. Um, we have uh, Juniper doing a fellowship with Leslie Loma Museum in New York. And then we have Jupiter doing a fellowship actually with the Women's Policy Institute of the Women's Foundation of California. And so like to su support and reinforce that leadership so that when, um, because I have to leave at some point. And so the first thing that I always think of is who replaces me and carries this work forward. And I think not a lot, not enough nonprofits do that. I think nonprofits end up being sort of centralized to the leadership. And that's not, that's not something I believe in. I believe that the leader's job is to find the next leader, like that's, or leaders, right? That can lead that work so that that work continues if that's the mission of the organization. And being that we design the district to be lasting for hundreds of years, Japantown just um, celebrated its 100th year anniversary as a cultural district in San Francisco. And so being that our work is designed in that way, um, uh, it's expected that the leadership always find the next leader. The Supreme has to find the next Supreme. I'm just saying. That's a reference from Coven. Um, sorry, y'all, I'm a nerd. Anyways, some projects aren't designed that way. And so I think that's something that the leadership has to look at. Like I founded a project called Clean Culture Initiative um, years ago, an empowerment program for Black trans women, I closed the project because, and you know, it wasn't bad, it was good because so many other Black trans women who had been a part of that sorority or that group or those programs went on to start their own Black trans empowerment work in Sacramento or all these other cities, right? And that was the whole point. It wasn't designed to be this like long standing institution. And so sometimes, you know, when we work in the nonprofit space, we have to evaluate whether our project is responsive, responding to a time and an, a sort of series of issues, or if it is meant to be a long-standing institution. That's beautiful. And I remember y'all making the proclamation for Trans uh, uh, History Month because it was on um, it was on a birthday of someone special, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> 
Yes. Um, you know, that was actually coincidental. It yeah. was um, it was very coincidental, but it was almost perfect. So we um, we were able to have the ceremony and the proclamation be signed for Trans History Month on Marsha P. Johnson's birthday. Um, and what an amazing gift, I think, to our community. And I think also just, you know, I know that on the flip side, like I always am torn about being sort of a cultural worker and that my work is focusing on preserving and uplifting the culture of trans people. But then I'm, I also come from being an advocate. And so, you know, there's a part of me that's like, well, what does that do for trans people who are experiencing homelessness or, you know, not able to access employment? Like, is that empowering? But I think the great thing about this effort that we did is that it really does celebrate and you know cement the fact that trans people have existed through the dawn of time and that we didn't just fall out of the sky in 2007 which is often the popular opinion right like so many workplaces are like oh now we got to do those pronouns but it's like you know now you're just hearing that trans people have agency to talk about our bodies and our experiences and demand that respect ones that we did not have before um, but we also have a very rich history and culture with so many of our community not knowing about it. Um, I think me, Honey, and Jeanette are very fortunate in that, you know, our work involved working with some world-renowned historians who were telling us about trans histories that I'd never heard of, both about our neighborhood, but also just around the world. And like, the more of the world needs access to that history. Um, and I think it, it only empowers our community more. And final question for y'all. This is going to be a lightning round because I know we're up on time. Um, but, um, and we'll start with uh, Janetta, then Hani, then Aria. Uh, what are some current projects or initiatives that y'all want to amplify on this space, on this platform? Um. Well, I can talk a little bit more because as everybody shared that we all are founders of the district, but we all have our prospective jobs. And, and the whole premise for me was to secure the district, but it's always been my thought process is to ensure that another young Black trans person do the decorating and the creativity and creating the opportunities within their district because I am currently working with uh, trans people coming out of jails and prison um, and providing support, opportunity, housing, employment, um, supporting them and getting into health care and all those things. And uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of people can identify with the fact that um, uh, Black trans-led organizations are either being unhoused or experiencing a lot of gentrification, not necessarily having a safe place for their organizations to live. And you got to think about the constant moving and the interruptions that this moving is causing the community that you serve who are facing um, who has a long history of being chronically homeless and unhoused and <clears throat> as well as our organization. We're trying to house people and we're barely housed. You know what I mean? We're, we're barely housed. So um, my current most important work that I'm working on right now is Black ownership, um, ensuring that Black, Black and brown trans people specifically has been chronically homeless, unhoused, been through the foster care system, you know, experienced all the things, um, creating a safer place for them to be. And we're looking to um, buy a building at TGIJP, um, TGIJP to support to create a safer place for our communities to be. And specifically as we think about people coming out of prison, trans people coming out of prison, like um, certain neighborhoods are just not befitting to people coming directly out of prison and expecting to, them to, to thrive and being and living in the same environment that, um, 
has been very hard for them to um, uh, make necessary decisions. So um, basically, TJJP is in the process of buying a brand new building. We've got, we have a location. We've raised a, um, some money. We have a capital campaign out there um, that you could go out to our website and find a little bit more information about. Um, and we have an address location that we're really, really excited about that would create the programs that we're interested in creating because here at TGIJP, we provide employment, um, social economic justice opportunities for trans people <clears throat> um, coming out of jails and prison. And, um, but also we need to provide more job opportunities, um, more looking more at a immediate access to employment when people come out of prison, specifically when you work with people that have spent 20, 25, 30 years in prison and they come to your doorstep and they're looking for opportunity and you don't have the access. Um, but it's been very challenging having 14 to 16 staff people working in 537 square feet. Um, so that's a project that we've been working really, really hard. Um, we just recently, um, I mean, from the beginning to the pandemic up until now, we've housed at least about 75 um, community members into various um, housing structures. So it's, it's really for us, the big thing is, is having black ownership black safety and black trans led because um it's just been really hard over the years trying to serve community and constantly having to move constantly having the lack of space so yeah i think the most exciting thing that we're doing right now tjjp is buying a building and we've been doing we've been trying to buy find some safer opportunity since 2016 and yeah so yeah and the current building we where that we work in is too hot in the summertime that staff can't work too cold in the winter time that staff can't work and we have rats in our building and we have holes in the floor where the rats run to when we come in and um it seems like trans people always end up in some of the worst conditions and we're looking to move to what feels safer, like a safer, cleaner, um, sustainable environment for us to provide for our constituents. Um, particularly when you look at people coming directly out of jails and prison, we wanna create a much better, safer opportunity. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah. And Honey and Arya, in 30 seconds, do you folks have any uh, other projects or initiatives? Where could we follow you and other initiatives that you want to share out? Um, I guess the main thing that I'm doing right now, just quickly, is that I'm, you know, as chair of San Francisco's Democratic Party, fighting against many of the recall efforts that have been happening and, you know, doing some fundraising for the Democratic Party. I have to raise, you know, annually 125K, which is, which is both not a lot and also a lot of money when you have other, you know, several other full-time jobs. So um, <laughs> if anyone wants to help by donating to the San Francisco Democratic Party, you can find it, uh, more information on sfdemocrats.org. Um, you know, again, it is currently a, a Black trans-led initiative. And, you know, I think my work in the party is also how do we uplift the voices of the most marginalized and make the Democratic Party more inclusive of um, the needs of people like me um, and of other communities. Like there's currently no member of the San Francisco Democratic Party who identifies, who's, who's Muslim, um, who identifies as an indigenous, uh, from an indigenous community here. Um, and so there's just lots of opportunity to see more people and more representation in the Democratic Party. So that's what I'm working on. And um, yeah, okay, 30 seconds. Um, Y'all can find out more about all the things that we're working on. I can't um, stress enough. I think one thing to highlight is we are working with different cities across the country to replicate. LGBT districts or trans districts in their cities. So we just recently 
have been working with Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta to start an LGBT district. We did a visit to New York. The city of New York is interested in doing something similar. Um, and then we've worked with like Austin and what have you um, to replicate those things. But if you'd like to learn more, is someone chewing? Hi. If you'd like to learn more about the transgender district and all the amazing work that we get to lead, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook. We're verified on all platforms at Transgender District. You can also go to our website, transgenderdistrictsf.com. Um, and of course, you can follow me. I'm verified on all platforms as well at Aria Saeed. Everywhere that you can find me, you can all those things and learn more about our work and how to get involved if you're interested in volunteering and or like learning wanting to replicate a trans district lgbt district in your own neighborhood in your own city please do not hesitate to reach out to us um you can email us um all of that information is on our website um and again thank you so much to the office of lgbt affairs um for Santa Clara County for having us and letting us reunite in such a beautiful way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you folks. Everybody give it up for the co-founders of the Transgender District in San Francisco, Aria, Honey, and Janetta. Show them the love, show them in the chat. I know we're on a virtual platform, but show them the love. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So much rich information. And um, yeah, thank you for being our keynote speakers for this year's LGBTQ Summit.